Okay. Uh, so, a great pleasure to have uh, Vicky Bikia or Bikia? Bikia. Bikia uh, today. So, uh, Vicky is a, a postdoctoral researcher in uh, EPFL and she will start soon in uh, Stanford. Uh, Vicky got uh, her PhD in the Department of Bioengineering from uh, EPFL. Uh, and before that, she did her undergraduate in um, electrical and computer engineering in uh, Aristotle University of uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, uh, her interests are in uh, machine learning and non-invasive uh, cardiovascular monitoring. And uh, she has written many papers, including papers in nature, and uh, she has also US uh, patents and so on. So the title is Harnessing Physics Driven Modeling and Artificial Intelligence for non-invasive cardiovascular health monitoring. So we hear you with pleasure. Thanks a lot for talking to us today. Thank you, thank you. So uh, good afternoon, um, I'm Piki Bikia and it's a great pleasure to be uh, presenting today at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the Technical University of Crete as part of the Machine Learning and Data Science course. Uh, first of all, I would really like to thank Professor uh, Bekaris Liberis for this uh, honorary invitation and for the kind introduction. Uh, so uh, today I'm going to present to you a part of my work uh, which is on how we can harness physics-driven modeling and artificial intelligence or AI for non-invasive cardiovascular health monitoring. And this work was conducted mainly in the Laboratory of Hemodynamics and Cardiovascular Technology at EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm an electrical and computer engineer uh, by education, uh, graduated from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, where I also come from. And I received my PhD uh, degree in bioengineering from EPFL uh, in, under the supervision of Professor Nikolos Turgiopoulos um, in his laboratory of hemodynamics and cardiovascular technology, which is a pioneering uh, laboratory in modeling the cardiovascular system and in developing novel tools for health monitoring. And over the last years, I had the opportunity to work with brilliant scientists around the world. And what I'm presenting today is part of this work. So today's presentation uh, is divided in three main parts. In the first introductory part, I'm going to present to you the motivation behind this work, uh, some background on cardiovascular monitoring and why this is important, uh, current state of the art, we will talk about AI and especially AI in cardiovascular healthcare. Uh, we will present some concepts on numerical modeling of the cardiovascular system and we will define the specific aims of today's presentation. Then moving on to the main body, uh, we will dive into the details on uh, three methods, um, including predictive models for three major cardiovascular parameters. And finally, we, we will close this presentation by summarizing some overall conclusion and takeaway messages. So improving cardiovascular monitoring uh, and making it accessible is something that concerns us all. In a progressively aging population, it is of utmost importance to define and update major cardiovascular parameters whose monitoring may allow us to improve the assessment of cardiovascular disease and thus to improve the quality of our life. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide, and they are responsible for around 70.5 million deaths per year. By 2030, this number is expected to rise up to 23 million. Importantly, and very sadly, one in 10 people between the age of 30 and 70 will die prematurely from cardiovascular disease. The good news though, at least 80% of these premature deaths could be prevented or delayed via the early detection and effective monitoring of cardiovascular disease. But early detection and effective monitoring of disease entails three main requirements for the tools that are being used. That they're easily accessible, non-invasive and cost efficient. So the cornerstone of cardiovascular monitoring involves the measurement of two major quantities, the blood pressure and the blood flow. Measurement of blood flow uh, is classified into invasive methods, such as using a catheter um, into the arteries, uh, in fact, it is the, into the arteries, or invasive methods, including sphygma manometry, conventional cuff that you're probably familiar with, applanation tonometry, and many more. Similarly, the measurement of blood flow can be performed by invasive means and by non-invasive means with the most common methods, including phase contrast and magnetic resonance imaging and ultrasound. 
So in clinical practice, there is a wide variety of measuring methods for cardiovascular monitoring, and those methods are different to each other with respect to the quantity they measure and the location to which they're applied. So data can be acquired either in the peripheral sites, such as the arm, the wrist, the leg, many more, or at central sites like the aorta and the heart. So from now on, we will refer to data acquired uh, in the heart or at the aorta as central measurements and data acquired in peripheral sites at locations that are distal to the heart as peripheral measurements. So there are different ways to acquire peripheral data. Uh, and one of the most common ones is the sphygmomanometry that uses an inflatable cuff that measures uh, the blood pressure at the, the brachial artery. And this is a rather easy and non-invasive method to do so. On the other hand, acquiring data, central, central measurements data in the heart or the aorta can be more challenging. There are methods including either invasive procedures or inconvenient techniques such as MRI uh, and others that they, they require heavy, large and expensive machinery. So what I would like you to keep in mind and to, to keep from this slide is that in general, uh, peripheral measurements are easier to get in a non-invasive way while central measurements are harder to get. And what is the problem here? The problem here is that it has been shown that data acquired in the heart or at the root of the aorta have been shown to be more powerful predictors of clinical outcomes and disease in comparison to data acquired in the periphery. So we understand that there is a need to transform those peripheral non-invasive data that we are having at hand into the more powerful, more relevant, clinically relevant central quantities of interest. So a few words about the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system includes the heart, which is the powerhouse, the blood vessels, and the blood. All those work together to transfer nutrients and oxygen to all the parts of the body and then carry the oxygenated blood back to the lungs. A very easy way to think of the cardiovascular system is using an electrical analog circuit. This is one of the most simple models that you can use. So you can think of the heart as the battery, the voltage source, the arteries as resistors, and the blood flow as an electrical current. We can also introduce the concept of uh, compliance, liking it to the capacitance of the electrical circuit. And basically the compliance or the capacitance uh, expresses the ability of the arteries to expand, to stretch um, and distend in response to the blood exerted onto their walls. And this is also a concept that we, that we, we very easily refer to as stiffness, elasticity in, in, in physiology. And there, of course, there are different uh, ways to, to model the cardiovascular system, uh, even with this lamp parameter model, using different uh, levels of detail, depending on the application you have in mind. So in order to be able to uh, monitor the function of the system, uh, it is critical that we uh, estimate that we are able to predict and monitor uh, some major cardiovascular parameters. And Especially now we're going to talk about three uh, main parameters that will be our target parameters via our estimation methods that we will present later. So the first one is the arctic systolic blood pressure. Blood pressure varies throughout the arterial tree at different parts of the body. That means that different arterial locations have different blood pressure values. And uh, formally, uh, the blood pressure is amplified while it travels from the heart that the signal is being transmitted towards the periphery. Uh, so blood pressure is a crucial pathophysiological parameter and is typically measured in millimeters of mercury. And it has two uh, important values to remember. The aortic systolic blood pressure, which is defined as the maximum pressure at the aorta over a heart cycle, and the aortic diastolic blood pressure, which is defined as the minimum uh, pressure um, at the aorta over a heart cycle. So aortic systolic blood pressure is a critical index for diagnosis and prevention of cardiovascular diseases. As you can imagine, uh, acquiring directly uh, aortic systolic blood pressure would require us to use invasive methods due to the location of the aorta under uh, the thorax. In this respect, calf arm uh, pressure readings have been used extensively as surrogate for the central blood pressure. 
and the simplicity and the non-invasive nature uh, of this technique has rendered it the best so far alternative. Of course, there are uh, several uh, commercial, uh, both commercial and research methods that have used um, this peripheral pressure recordings to transform them into central aortic pressure recordings using uh, different techniques such as generalized transfer functions, moving average techniques, and machine learning techniques, and so on. However, a lot of these methods do not provide personalized estimation while they rely on simplified and unrealistic assumptions. The next parameter that we're going to talk about is cardiac output. Cardiac output quantifies uh, the blood volume that the heart expels uh, in its heartbeat per, per unit time. Cardiac output is a fundamental um, indicator of the overall circulatory uh, function uh, reflecting the heart's efficiency to transport blood and nutrients and oxygen to the different, uh, to the different parts of the body. So cardiac output is typically measured in milliliters per second or liters per minute and can be derived as the mean value, the average value of the aortic flow waveform of a heart cycle um, uh, in a measurement. So uh, abnormalities in cardiac output uh, leading to uh, deviation from the normal values can be a great indicator of hearts of failing pumping function. And this is why we, we really need to ensure regular monitoring of this parameter. So the current state of the art uh, include methods such as the magnetic resonance imaging and ultrasound. However, as you may imagine, these methods require large, heavy and expensive machinery. Uh, those methods are dependent to the operator, and a lot of studies have shown that ultrasound derivation can suffer from inaccuracies. And finally, the concept of cardiac contractility, as this one is assessed uh, via the elastance, uh, is another important parameter to monitor. So the elastance concept, concept assumes that the heart muscle stiffens um, between different phases over the cycle, and especially from diastole to systole. And uh, this change in stiffness is what the elastance concept expresses. And in particular, in this presentation, we are interested in uh, observing the elastance value at the end of the systole, uh, where the systole is the phase uh, where, the, where the heart contracts and the blood pan is pumped into the artery to be distributed among the different parts of the body. And uh, this uh, parameter is called end systolic elastance. End systolic elastance is a major index of cardiac contractility, and apart from that, uh, it provides useful information on how the arteries and the heart interact with each other. So the gold the gold standard method for uh, acquiring end systolic elastance involves invasive procedures, and uh, that's why current state of the art have has focused on um, indirect non-invasive methods which however rely on less accurate uh, techniques uh, with expensive and inconvenient mag magnetic resonance imaging or ultrasound measurements. So now that we summarized the, the parameters that we will target with our methods, uh, the goal here is to use the peripheral non-invasive data that are available to the clinician and transform them uh, to those central quantities of interest, which will be the aortic systolic blood pressure, the maximum value of the pressure at the aorta, the cardiac output, the blood volume expelled by the heart per minute, and end systolic elastance that you can think of it as the stiffness of, of the heart. And basically what we want to do here is to map unknown uh, known data uh, like the peripheral non-invasive measurements in our case, to unknown data, which are the central quantities. And when thinking about association of known data X to unknown data Y, uh, this evokes thoughts on artificial intelligence. So a great way of thinking um, about artificial intelligence or AI is as a set of tools. And AI has a wide variety of, of, of techniques available. Supervised learning is uh, the, most common, the most commonly used one and one of the most useful one, which is really good at recognizing things and labeling things. So if you're familiar with AI, you might have uh, heard of other techniques as well. 
including uh, Gen AI, which is a rather new, exciting technology, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. And of course, all of these uh, techniques have found applications in healthcare with supervised learning techniques used for predict predictive risk models or patient certification through unsupervised learning or adaptive treatment optimization via reinforcement learning and some newer studies on how we can use Gen AI to, uh, to create clinical language representation of admission notes. So the concept of mapping specific data like symptoms, medical history, laboratory tests to a clinical outcome is not new to medicine and it's called basically diagnosis. Uh, so supervised learning is really, really good at creating mappings of uh, input output and X to Y. So if someone wants to basically to create a model that predicts Y from X, all they have to do is to collect a few data points, create a data set, split this data set into a training set and a test set, use the training set to train a machine learning model and then deploy it, and then use this model um, on the test data and use it inference. We can have predictions on the test set, which has been held out entirely of the learning process. Uh, so the last decade has been a uh, decade of a large scale supervised learning. And this is something that was permitted due to breakthroughs in several aspects related to AI. Uh, and those include uh, data variability, uh, advancements in modeling, algorithms, and infrastructure. So on the cardiovascular health, um, on the cardiovascular health, there has been an abundance of data that has been created that creates tremendous opportunities for advanced diagnosis, prognosis, and medical data interpretability. So machine learning becomes the beacon for innovation. So quality data fuels models trained using advanced uh, supervised learning techniques to uh, either predict major cardiovascular quantities or to predict cardiovascular risks or events. And all this tools provide a great aid to the clinician in the clinical decision-making process. So using exist existing models has been uh, made remarkably fast and easy thanks to the proliferation of libraries and user-friendly frameworks. And there is a wide array of available models, including decision tree-based models, neural networks, linear models, gradient boosting, and many, many more. And options like TensorFlow, PyTorch, I could learn, and other have enabled the developer to, to integrate those models in their applications, in their projects, without the need for extensive or deep machine learning algorithm knowledge. So another interesting concept um, is that also some models, um, like neural network network mod based models that can use raw input data um, instead of manually extracted features to their modeling process. And uh, this is done by deciphering hidden, hidden information, higher level uh, piece of information and bend it into the raw data. And this can even lead to improve um, uh, accuracy uh, for the model. And this is something that we will uh, talk about later uh, in one of the methodologies that we will explore. So if anyone is interested in learning more about uh, application of uh, supervised learning and uh, supervised learning in, in vascular aging application, feel free uh, to take a look at our latest review. It also includes some case studies for practice and discuss uh, other future directions uh, in the field. Now I'd like to spend some sl slides talking about numerical modeling of the cardiovascular system. So understanding um, all this complex uh, and nonlinear relationships among different uh, variables of the cardiovascular system can be rather challenging. So models of the cardiovascular system allow us to disentangle uh, the function and the mechanism related to this uh, system via the use of mathematical analysis and computer simulations. Basically, we are having a model on the screen of our computer. And those models, uh, they, can, they come like in different uh, dimensions, like we can have 0D models, 1D models, 3D models, depending on the uh, level of detail and accuracy that we require for the specific application under consideration. But what all these models have in common is that they offer a long list of advantages. Uh, they provide a fair presentation of the real system while they allow us to understand how physiological mechanisms uh, work. Uh, they also offer noise-free signals and they give us access to data which are difficult to obtain in vivo, meaning in the real, 
a live clinical setting. So especially in this talk, we will focus um, on the use of a 1D cardiovascular model, which was developed in our laboratory at uh, Lausanne TPFL by Philippe Raymond in 2009. This is one of the most complete models in the literature. It consists of 103 arteries that you can see here. Um, uh, the numbers, you could, I think you can, see, you can see them well, hopefully. And it includes also the brain circulation and the coronary circulation. The coronaries are those small arteries hugging the heart over here. So I, would, I don't really want to dive into the details of, on the simulator, but what I would like you to keep from this slide is that this model can be fully described by its geometry, its anatomical information, the length of its artery, the area, um, this, the cross-sectional area uh, of its artery, the diameter, uh, the stiffness, uh, the resistance, and uh, all this information that are criti critical for solving the model. And then uh, it receives a proximal boundary condition, either a zero D heart model, uh, which is that here coupled at the root of the aorta, or uh, the aortic flow uh, waveform. And as a terminal boundary condition, it receives an electrical circuit, but you can think of it as an electrical circuit that summarize all the cumulative effect of the microcirculation. And then the equations of the model are being solved. And what is really exciting here is that we are able to have um, pressure and flow waveforms along the entire arterial tree. So basically, basically we can choose at which part we want to, uh, to acquire the pressure and the flow, and we can have it by solving the model. And this model has been thoroughly validated in the past and have, has been so capable of producing faithful and clinically relevant representations of blood pressure and flow waves. Uh, so now I'd like to spend some seconds on, um, uh, on explaining the pressure and the flow variation over a cycle very briefly, because those are terms that we're going to revisit later in the presentation. So basically here uh, to the left, we're having the pressure variation over a heart cycle at the aorta. And again, we're having the aortic systolic yes. blood pressure that we talked about, and the aortic diastolic blood pressure, which is the minimum uh, pressure at the aorta. In a similar way, we're having the, the same concept for the brachial artery, which is the artery uh, placed located at the arm. And we're having the brachial systolic blood pressure uh, and the brachial diastolic blood pressure. And finally, uh, as we said, cardiac output can be derived if we have the aortic uh, blood flow waveform and it's being derived as the mean value uh, of, of this signal. Again, if you're interested in learning more about how the, those models can be developed, how they work, uh, there's also very detailed technical supplement in this uh, in this review paper. Free, free to to check it out, and also feel free to reach out if you're having any questions uh, that follow up your, your your readings. So, a really exciting concept uh, when using those one D models is that we can generate uh, large in silico synthetic data sets of virtual uh, subjects in a very cost efficient, fast an easy way. And basically what we can do is that we can take the model that we're having and run it multiple times by altering its parameters every time. For example, we can decide on a random Gaussian sampling um, distribution for the parameters, then run the model multiple times by changing its parameters. And then we create a pool of simulated data. And then we're able to filter those data using specific thresholds. And we end up having a large uh, data set including physiological pressure and flow waveforms of the virtual population of thousands of, uh, of, of virtual patients or even hundreds of thousands. And this is really useful, especially if we'd like to use it for, for machine learning applications where uh, data availability is a big thing. And this brings us to uh, defining the overall aim. The overall aim here is to develop and validate non-invasive methods that can provide us estimations of central cardiovascular biomarkers. And this can be done by using both physics-based modeling and, mach and machine learning. And the specific aims of this presentation is to, to create uh, monitors that can derive central hemodynamics. And by central hemodynamics, we refer to our systolic blood pressure and cardiac output using readily available non-invasive pressure data. 
acquired in the periphery, and to develop non-invasive predictors for cardiac contractility, as assessed via the end systolic elastance parameter that we talked about. And now if you're still with me, we, we are getting to our first method. So the aim of the first method is to, esti to estimate non-invasively cardiac output and aortic systolic blood pressure from multiple blood pressure uh, measurements. And especially, we will uh, get those non-invasive estimations of our extolic blood pressure and cardiac output by adjusting and one D, the 1D model that we described before uh, by rendering it patient-specific using those measured uh, input uh, measurements. So again, the goal here is to estimate those those uh, extolic blood pressure and cardiac output values by adjusting the 1D uh, model. And the, essentially the input data that we will uh, acquire for its subject include those three measurements, the arm cuff pressure and the arterial pulse on the neck and the groin. And from those measurements, we're able to extract uh, some features in conjunction, of course, with demographical information that can be rather informative in such models. So our input feature will include the age, the gender, the height, the weight, the heart rate, which is something that we can measure. And we will extract from the measurements, the brachial systolic blood pressure, the brachial diastolic blood pressure, which are basically the maximum and the minimum uh, values of pressure at the ARP, where, where the, bra the brachial artery is placed, and carotid to femoral, femoral pulse velocity. So carotid to femoral pulse velocity is an index uh, of arterial stiffness, and it can be derived as, uh, as the wave speed uh, for the wave traveling, the pressure wave traveling from the common carotid artery to the common femoral artery. So to acquire this, um, this marker, we can measure the pulse of the common carotid artery and the common femoral artery, then uh, estimate the time lag between uh, these two waveforms, basically the time that the wave needed to travel from the one location to the other. And by the definition of wave speed, we can divide the distance between the two arterial locations which in clinical practice can be estimated rather accurately, divided by the time lag and get the wave speed. And this wave speed is what we call carotid femoral pulse velocity. And what's important about this uh, measure is that it has been shown to be correlated with age and an indicator of several clinical outcomes. So again, we're having our eight uh, input features and we them to the generic 1D model that we described below, and then by running an optimization process, changing the models, the model's parameter, then we can create an adapted version of the 1D model, let's say a quasi-personalized uh, version of this model that then allow us to derive our systolic blood pressure and cardiac output. So in order to simplify a bit the input-output problem uh, uh, for the model, so Speaking of the model that we described, you can think of it as a model that it receives as inputs, those parameters, the arterial length of the artery, the, the length of the arteries, the diameter of the arteries, the heart rate, the compliance, the resistance, and cardiac output. So if we give those inputs to the model, then the model is able to provide to us the pressure and flow waveforms at all arteries. And if we're having the pressure and the flow waveforms at all arteries, we're able to get the brachial, systolic, and diastolic blood pressure and carotid femoral pulse velocity. So to make, to make it even easier to follow, let's say that those are the inputs of our model and the outputs are the brachial, systolic, and diastolic and pulse velocity. So basically what we can do is that the arterial length can be approximated using the height. So if we assume that we're having a model that corresponds to the model that we're having in the lab is a model that corresponds to, to um, a male uh, with a height of 180, let's say meters, then we can adjust in a uniform way uh, the length of the arteries for, for, for another uh, person under consideration, which is higher or shorter. In a similar way, uh, there have been studies that have um, correlated the diameter of the arteries with um, uh, information like age, gender, and BSI, which basically includes the weight and the height there. Then the heart rate is something that we measure. So those three parameters basically are uh, have already uh, been assigned with some values. And then we end up having the compliance, the resistance, and the cardiac output that are unknown uh, to our model. 
And basically those are the ones that need to be optimized in order to control the outputs. So going back to the optimization algorithm. So if we provide those inputs uh, to, to our model and then chose, uh, choose some arbitrary values for the compliance, the resistance of the cardiac output, we fit the model with those data and we solve it. Then from the model, we're going to get the brachial systolic and diastolic blood pressure and the, and the pulse wave velocity. What we do then is to compare those simulated uh, data uh, to the actual data acquired for the specific person under consideration. The first time that we ran the model using the arbitrary values for these three parameters here, we, we expect that the comparison between the actual and the simulated data will give us different values. So in this, uh, in this case, we modify using a gradient descent based algorithm the compliance, resistance, and cardiac output. And we fit it back to the model. And this process basically is repeated until uh, convergence uh, is reached. So basically until simulated and actual data match. Once this, is, this has happened, then we can assume that we're having a quasi-personalized uh, version of the arterial tree model. And then this will allow us to have also the arctic systolic blood pressure and cardiac output. I'm saying quasi-personalized here because we had made some assumptions regarding uh, some of the input parameters. And of course, uh, it's a model we're talking about. So we cannot really say that we have performed a perfectly uh, matching version of the model to the specific person under consideration. So in order to appraise this concept in vivo, we collected data from 20 subjects. And uh, what we have done here is like to perform measurements for the data of interest, uh, demographics, the brachial systolic and diastolic, pulse wave velocity, and then the reference data, the aortic systolic blood pressure cardiac output using user reference uh, commercial techniques. And we compared the estimated uh, data from our uh, model, from our inverse, let's say, problem solving method to the reference data. Here to the left, you can see the results for the arctic systolic blood pressure. Uh, on the y-axis, we're having the predicted data, while on the x-axis, we're having the reference data. And we can see that a high level of accuracy has been achieved here with a very high correlation um, value of 0 0.98, uh, while the, uh, the, up, the, the absolute error uh, was found to be less than five millimeters of mercury for the totality of the cases. And this five millimeter of mercury is the threshold that has been um, derived from the European guidelines for accurate blood pressure monitors. Moving now to the right side, we're having the results for the cardiac output. And here we can see again that uh, the model performed pretty well with a high uh, correlation again of 0 0.91 and uh, an absolute error below uh, 0.3 liters per minute for almost half of the cases. So we can see that overall our, our method performed pretty well. And this brings us to some uh, main conclusions. So we saw that indeed the 1D model can be successfully calibrated using as sole input non-invasive and readily available peripheral blood pressure data. And basically this approach enables to create a quasi patient specific profile with these for its patient. Uh, then card cuff blood pressure and pulse wave velocity were appear to, to be sufficient to estimate aortic hemodynamics, namely the aortic systolic blood pressure and cardiac output using this inverse method that we talked about. And finally, the next crucial step involves the validation of these techniques using gold standard measures of aortic systolic blood pressure and cardiac output. And gold standard me measures include invasive techniques. Uh, so uh, we're currently running, uh, currently running um, a clinical study uh, in the hospital of Geneva, where we're collecting invasive data for cardiac output uh, from a pool of patients. And we expect to finalize our validation in vivo soon. Moving now to the next method, uh, here, the, the first thing will be the same with the one that we uh, saw in our previous method. So again, we want to estimate our systolic blood pressure and cardiac output, but now we will also target and systolic elastins. So in here, we will use machine learning instead. So again, we're going to keep the same input, um, the same input uh, features, the brachial systolic and diastolic blood pressure, cardiac output and pulse wave velocity. But this time we will use a synthetically generated 
data set of virtual patients of around 40,000 40, um, virtual patients. And we will aim to get aortic systolic blood pressure, cardiac output, and systolic elastins. And especially for end systolic elastins, we're going to perform an extra experiment that we will use ejection fraction as an extra input for the estimation of end systolic elastins. So ejection fraction is a measure of the percentage of blood exp expelled by the heart uh, ventricle with its contraction. And it's an, an important indicator of the overall heart's function and efficiency. And it's a central measurement, which makes it different to the other inputs. So again, we're going to split our data set to, uh, to we, we're, we're going to perform a validate, core validation technique where we're gonna keep some data for the training and some uh, left out subjects will be used for the testing process. And especially here, we tested four different uh, machine learning models, including random forest, support vector re regressor, reach, and gradient boosting. So uh, we chose to perform a 10-fold cross-validation uh, for, for our training uh, validation and test processes. And uh, here you can see the hyperparameters that we chose to optimize for each of uh, the model. Here you can see the values. And by performing grid search, uh, we end up selecting which of the values perform better um, for the data that we gave to the model. So here I'm going to present to you only the results for the best performing model, which in our case was the support vector regressor. And basically here you can see that from the iterations, um, from the tenfold cross-validation, uh, those are in bold, you can see the parameters that were selected uh, more frequently. And those are the parameters that were used finally for, uh, for uh, our analysis. And, uh, Taking a look at the results here, again, we're having uh, the results for the arctic systolic blood pressure to the left. The predictions are on the y-axis and the reference data on the x-axis. And in a similar way, we're having the results for cardiac output. And we see that in both cases, the support vector uh, regressor performed really, really well, reaching high levels of accuracy and correlation with zero biases from the blunt Altman uh, analysis and narrow limits of agreement, which are defined basically within, which are within the 90%, 95% 90 of errors lie within. Moving now to the antistolic elastins, we see that for this set of inputs, the brachial systolic and diastolic heart rate and pulse rate velocity, we were unable to get estimations of antistolic elastins. Actually, our model performs really, really poorly. Uh, guesses uh, the ancestral last models without uh, achieving uh, a high correlation or even a satisfactory one. But this quite interesting here is that when the injection fraction information was added to the input vector, we saw a great improvement in the accuracy of the model, which is actually a quite high level of, uh, of correlation uh, equal to 0 0.92. So, Taking a deeper look into uh, the feature importances here for its parameter, we saw that for the arctic systolic blood pressure, the brachial systolic blood pressure was the most uh, important feature in the input list. Uh, the same was the case for cardiac output followed by the pulse wave velocity. And finally, for the end systolic elastins, we saw that ejection fraction hold most of the important information, holds most of the important information followed by the rest of the features with lower uh, feature importance levels. And by performing also feature engineering here, we, we, we ended up like observing the same results as well. So for the next step, we wanted to validate this concept in vivo using real human data. And that was feasible for the aortic systolic blood pressure estimator. In general, it's rather difficult to acquire a lot of data for, for uh, central quantities, as we mentioned also in the introduction. So in this respect, we collected uh, the same data that we use for our analysis uh, for the development of the Arctic systolic blood pressure estimator from around 80, 800 subjects. And we compared the, the, the estimations from the machine learning model to the reference data acquired from the population. And we performed two experiments. The first experiment, uh, included the validation of the model, of a model that was trained entirely on the in silico data. 
So we took, again, the best performing model, the support vector regressor. We trained uh, the model on the uh, in silico data, and then we test the resulted model on the uh, real population uh, of the 800 uh, patients. And the second experiment was to perform the same tenfold cross-validation using only the uh, 783 uh, real subjects. And here you can see the results. So in both, in both uh, plots, the test set uh, was in vivo data. And what differs the two uh, plots here is the, um, in, uh, the, tra uh, the training set, which in this case here to the left, is the in silico data and here is the in vivo data. And we can see that there is a high performance achieved in both cases. And as expected, we're having a slightly improved performance when the in vivo data were used for the training, which is rather expected, expected if we assume that the real data um, describe much better the content of the test data because they come from the same population. So uh, reaching our conclusions, um, so we saw that peripheral non-invasive blood pressure measurements uh, can provide a strong source of information to accurately predict our systolic blood pressure and cardiac output through machine learning. Uh, that was not the case for the end-systolic elastins, where the inclusion of ejection fraction was necessary in order to achieve accurate estimates of this parameter. Uh, it was really impressive to see how machine learning can be a great alternative uh, to solve the same problem that we explored before with the inverse uh, method and how it can, you, it can provide a tremendous um, opportunities for development uh, of methods for the cardiovascular health monitoring. And what was particularly interesting to see in this study is that in silico data can be a rather informative um, uh, piece of information uh, a, rather, a rather useful piece of information for designing in vivo studies. And in a lot of cases, in synthetic data can replace uh, real data in the training process, especially in cases where it's really difficult to hard and hard to find uh, real data for, for training our algorithms. And finally, it is important to mention that we still need to validate the cardiac output, the end systolic elastins estimators in vivo in order to further validate their clinical utility in real life um, uh, clinical environments. And finally, um, in, in this work, we uh, focused on the estimation of end systolic elastins solely uh, from the brachial blood pressure waveform. And we do that by leverage. We did that by leveraging um, the potential in using convolution neural networks. So, especially in this study, we wanted to explore if it's possible to derive this important cardiac index using as a sole input the blood pressure measure at the R at the brachial artery. So, in this respect, we used again a virtual uh, population that was derived using our models. Here, we're having again around. 4,000 um, subjects. And for all of the subjects, we acquired a simulated brachial blood pressure that you can see here. And then we performed two experiments. We first want to explore if it's how accurate uh, will be our estimation of ancestolic elastins if we use only brachial blood pressure as an input to a convolution run network model. And what will happen if we use both the brachial blood pressure waveform and its derivative. So some information uh, here about the training testing process. We use the train validation test plate of 60-20-20. And uh, some specifications about our model here. We use the Adam optimizer. And as a, loss as a loss function, we use mean square error. The learning rate was set to 0 0.0001. And we perform hyperparameter tuning for the batch size and the epochs using grid search. Again, and here we're also presenting some information about the filters per channel. You can find more information about those processes uh, in the paper. Uh, in general, I would like to mention that it's really hard to 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 explore all, all, all possible solutions for the architecture of of the of, of a problem, especially when there is no previous literature on the number of the filters, uh, the number of the filters that can be used, and other information about the architecture. So you really need to test and try different techniques until you're having something that makes sense for your application. And here you can take a brief look at the architecture. So um, 
both of the both of the CNNs that we created um, include three uh, convolution la layers followed by ReLU function and the fourth one, which is followed by the max uh, pool um, layer, which is basically the sub sabling uh, filter that reduces the spatial uh, dimension of the input volume and also reduces the complexity of the, the computational complexity of the network and also helps us to avoid overfitting. Then the max pooling layer is followed by a flatter and linear layer and we're able to get the empty stolic elastance estimation. And here we can see the results for the two, uh, for the two models. Um, to the left, we're having the results for the first model that used only the brachial blood pressure as an input, and to the right, we're having the model that used both the brachial, brachial, both, both the brachial blood pressure uh, and its derivative. And we see that although the performance is rather satisfactory for both of the models, there is a significant improvement for the second model where the derivative was used as, as an input with the correlation uh, being increased from 0 0.86 to 0 0.97. And again, we see that very low, low bias biases were provided by the blunt element analysis and the limits of Riemann were found to be rather low. This is quite impressive to be able to, to show that we can get antisystolic elastins, a major cardiac index, using as a sole input uh, a measurement that is being collected very, very um, frequently and easily uh, from the clinician on a daily basis at their office, namely the brachial blood pressure. Um, so another concept that we wanted to explore was to see the sensitivity of the method to added noise. So in this respect, we selected different levels of signal to noise ratio. And here you can see how uh, the different SNR values uh, affect and distort the input brachial um, waveform. Here we chose uh, an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary uh, brachial blood pressure from one subject. And here we present uh, the changes in correlation. Of course, you can you can see changes in a lot of other metrics, um, but this this gives a quite uh, easy nuance on on the performance of the model here. Um, so here you can see that up to a level of fifty decibels of SNR, uh, the CNN model performs better. Uh, while after that, we saw that um, the CNN two uh, is highly affected by the decrease in the SNR value. And this, I would say, is rather expected due to the fact that the second uh, CNN model is dependent to two, uh, two, two times um, the error that is introduced to the brachial blood pressure waveform. So uh, in this study, we saw that it's possible to, um, to achieve an accurate prediction of cardiac contractility index as uh, assessed via the antisystolic elastance uh, index. And the, this is possible by using only the blood pressure waveform acquired at the brachial artery at the R. In general, uh, the model that used both the blood pressure wave at the uh, arm and its derivative was found to have a superior performance in comparison to the model use, using only uh, the blood pressure waveform at the arm. However, we saw that the first model, the second model, the first model, the one using the blood pressure waveform only, uh, was found to be more robust to noise, and this is attributed to the to its single input dependency. And Finally, what is really important is that we saw that CNN models can provide really uh, great tools for unraveling hidden information, higher level hidden information embedded in the morphology of, of, of the row, of the row brachial uh, blood pressure wave. And this can provide a deeper understanding of how the complexity is associated with cardiac contractility assessment. So now, in order to summarize, uh, the summarize the findings that we discussed uh, in the last paper, so for our hemodynamics, uh, we saw that the 1D arterial tree model uh, can indeed effect be effectively adjusted using only non-invasive peripheral blood pressure data, namely the cuff blood pressure and the pulse velocity, uh, in conjunction with demographical information. Uh, especially the information which is embedded in the calf blood pressure and pulse velocity was found to be sufficient to accurately estimate our systolic blood pressure and cardiac output using the inverse problem solving method. Uh, at the same time, machine learning can be a viable and notably time efficient, cost efficient alternative for the estimation of the same parameters. 
And this can, can provide tremendous opportunities in the field of cardiovascular uh, research and monitoring. And what was really interesting to see is that the application of transient learning uh, provided uh, find, uh, findings that in silico data can indeed be used as surrogate uh, to training machine learning models when available, when real human data are, are limited or unavailable or hard to find. And of course, uh, it's important to, to mention here that um, although that we saw that those models perform pretty well on in silico data, when it comes to uh, in view validation using human data, we might need to revisit those models and uh, even uh, perform more complicated structures and development in order to be able to adapt to, to the content of the real human data. And finally, uh, for counter-contractility, uh, we saw that uh, the estimation of n-systolic elastins, uh, which is an index of counter-contractility, was challenging when using only peripheral, uh, non-invasive peripheral blood pressure data. So the use of the central information, that's the one provided from injection fraction, was critical in order to have an accurate estimation of n-systolic elastins. Uh, what was really interesting to see was how we can exploit the entire morphology and the absolute values of the brachial blood pressure in order to estimate ancestolic elastins, and that was evident in our silico population. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the convolutional network structure allow us to decipher, to decipher higher level features that are beyond manual der derivation, and those and those, um, those practices provided us a more nuanced understanding of the complexities associated with the cardiocontractility index. And finally, while promising in silico, we definitely need to um, validate our results and those concepts in, uh, in real human data in order to further verify their clinical utility in the real uh, clinical environment, the real healthcare settings. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, machine learning and physics-driven modeling provide tremendous opportunities, and we as engineers need to contribute using our best methods and tools to improve health monitoring. So such models, once thoroughly validated in humans and standardized, can be integrated in wearable devices and therefore transform completely uh, continuous monitoring inside and outside uh, of the clinical uh, environment. And this is something that can potentially change or even save lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Because I think you are out of battery. Yes, I you can. Can you hear me, right? Yes, yes, very okay. well. OK, thank you very much. I think this is very interesting and very important. Uh, I don't know who has a question. And can you explain uh, once more how the silico data set was derived? Yeah, sure. Perhaps we can revisit the site just to have a better picture. So basically we're having this model that we described that is a pretty detailed model. It has all these input parameters that need to be defined. As we said, the geometry, uh, some mechanical properties of the arteries, um, the modeling of the heart or the root of the aorta, some terminal boundary conditions and so on. So we're having a set of inputs and then the output that we're getting from this model is basically the pressure uh, and flow waveforms uh, along the entire tree. So Basically, by altering these input parameters of the model and run this model mul multiple times, then we can create different versions of this model. So going back to the to the altering of the parameters. So basically, what we do here is that we um, we isolate the input parameters of the model, meaning the length, for example, or the diameter, or how stiff the aorta is, or how resistance resistant the uh, the um, distal parts are. And we try to find all this input data 
uh, of the model in the literature in previously published uh, papers. So a lot of research, uh, a lot of research labs or even companies have performed studies when they measure data on real on real humans and they publish those results. So we try to dig into the uh, to the literature and. Uh, and find how those input parameters of the model can vary in a population. Of course, uh, what, what you usually find in the literature is data in the form of max, uh, mean, average value, standard deviation. So you're getting distributions of how those parameters of the model, of those measurements basically, uh, can change in a real human population. So what we do is that we basically try to isolate those published, previously published data from human. And then we assume some sampling. Um, we make a, a sampling assumption from the literature data. And then we say that we chose for our model um, uh, that the length of the aorta will be within the cer this certain ra range. And we do the same for all the input parameters, for example. And then randomly, we choose those inputs and we feed those inputs to the model, and then the model ends up running multiple, multiple times with different sets of input, input parameters. Of course, because we had made some assumptions regarding the inputs, we end up with this pool of simulated data here in the middle, where we might have some abnormal uh, values for pressure, for example, because of the combination of the different input parameters. So perhaps we end up having um, let's say um, a blood pressure value of the aorta equal to 500. This is not possible, like right? such a high 500 millimeters of mercury, while it cannot even reach like half of this, um, of this value, uh, the aorta this person would be dead. So then after we're having all this data, we perform filtering. So especially we focus on pressure. We go back to the literature again, and we see from published data from, uh, from other researchers that um, the systolic blood pressure at the aorta should lie within certain limits in order to have a physiologically, um, let's say, uh, relevant subject. And we do the same for different, uh, for different values of pressure. And we compare the pressures from the pool of the simulated data to those that we have acquired from the literature. And then we dis disregard all those subjects that do not satisfy the criteria, the criteria that we set. And after that, we end up having uh, less, of course, uh, data because we have disregard disregarded those that they don't correspond to physiologically relevant subjects, uh, valid subjects, and we have the final in silico data set. Hope that, that was helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Hi. Thank you for Hello. the presentation. Uh, I have a general question. I no I've noticed that both in the models and in the and the three proposed algorithms, the let's say let's say the the outputs and the, the feasibility of this algorithm is actually uh, based on on real data and comparings. Is let's say is there any meaning of of like proving uh, that besides the the comparisons real data like proving mathematically uh, that the algorithms proposed are like somehow stable or for maybe uh, okay the uh, 800 people is well a huge uh, person but still is it is it any meaning of uh, proving more mathematically uh, what's going on with the with the stability, let's say, in a, in a general uh, discussion? Yeah. So, so uh, if I understand correctly, you are talking apart apart from just like taking the model and just see how well it performs, and it might perform pretty well, especially when we're using silico data because those data are derived from a, a deterministic model. Uh, yes, but still, uh, your data. Exactly. And uh, something that I, I, I didn't really mention in detail as a typical practice that we do when we're generating those data, and I will come back to your question, is that we also add some noise in order to distort the content of the perfect idealized data that we're creating. And of course, like those are uh, preliminary studies and the proof of concept studies. So we need to show first that those algorithms can perform on perfect data 
if we start some more onerous and time-consuming processes and performing clinical protocols to acquire all this data in uh, in vivo. But uh, if I understand correctly, what you're asking is more about uh, examining the model mathematically per se, right? Like uh, if it overfits or if it's stable, if it's like generalizable and things like that. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So yes, basically, this is something that we also need to perform. Uh, uh, some analysis that we also need to perform when we are building those models, because there is a very high risk of overfitting of all times. So what we basically do is, so the answer to your question is yes, it totally makes sense, because if we're having a model that overfits, then it's practically useless, we're not be able to first make predictions on a different set of data set that uh, is not directly related to the population that we're using for the training, even for the testing. And uh, we're using different techniques for that, like hyperparameter tuning is the first approach that uh, you can perform in order to reduce chances of overfitting. We are testing the learning curves uh, uh, most of the times to see how the error uh, changes um, with respect to the training and the testing sets and other techniques. Um, even like with this, um, we, we, with this test, this experiment that we performed in the second method where we wanted to see how the in silico trained model uh, can perform if it's tested on a totally different unknown uh, test set of real data. This is also kind of indication that yes, perhaps those models are stable and can be generalized uh, to, to different populations. I hope this answers the question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any question? Anybody else? I have a question. Maybe Chris, yes. Cool. Ah, okay. Yes, go ahead. It's my turn. Go ahead. Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, would you be capable of conducting? that level of research in a Greek university at the PhD level? That's the second question is a little bit more personal. Would you be willing to return back to Greece as a <laughs> faculty? Uh, I would be very glad to return back to Greece in general at some point in my life. And of course, uh, being a faculty in one of the Greek uh, universities would be an honor as well. Like I come, uh, I graduated from a Greek university and I'm very proud of the education that we provide, especially um, at our universities. Uh, this could be an option. Uh, it's not a short-term plan at the moment, but it could be in the future for sure. Okay. And uh, would that level of, uh, would that line of research be possible to be conducted in a Greek university? I mean, what kind of resources would you need? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, uh, I don't know if you noticed in the papers and the acknowledgements in the end, we're collaborating very closely with, with uh, Greek universities and hospitals. Like, uh, uh, our, like our collaborators in Greek universities doing a great job and they're having huge quantities of data that we're using both for training and validation purposes. We're in very close collaboration anyways. And like those tools that we are building basically uh, our, our computer based actually, we're having the models and if we have access to those data, we can definitely perform this analysis anywhere. But we're also do already doing this, like a large part of this work is being conducted in collaboration with Greek institutions. And I'm also very happy personally about that. Okay. Uh, would you be willing to take a look at our curriculum in the MLBS program and uh, sure. offer suggestions? Sure, sure. With great pleasure. I have already been taking a look on that. I will be more than happy to do it more thoroughly. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Vasiliki, thank you for a very nice presentation, which uh, combines physics and also machine learning, which is not something that uh, we, um, we find very often. So that's very nice. Uh, I have two questions which are kind of peripheral to your presentation. Mm -hmm. Uh, at one point, you mentioned that uh, you can use, instead of uh, features, you can use raw data. Um, and uh, there I was wondering if uh, these data are not uh, pre-processed. Uh, how, how can you tell anything about potential impact of artifacts in the data? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
So basically, uh, using the in silico data uh, allow us to surpass kind of this uh, this problem when dealing with artifacts and errors in the measurements of the data. Um, this is a big this is this is a big thing, and this is something we we don't really address here. Um, let's say that the the closest um, answer that I could give to this question is if we take a look at um, sorry, give me a moment to um, this slide when we introduce, let's say that we're measuring um, we're measuring the blood pressure at the brachial artery as we saw before. And when we're taking uh, this, um, this waveform from the model, um, the, waveform, the waveform would look like the dashed lines here, right? Like it's a perfect, it's a perfect signal. It's like we're measuring exactly what it's there, like the pressure that is there. When we're having, uh, when we're performing real uh, life measurements, then we're getting something more similar to to the red waveforms. I would say, not even like at those levels; those are near perfect. Something with errors, like and even more complicated errors and artifacts, as you said. So there has been um, literature that shows that um, certain uh, models, machine learning models. Uh, could potentially be able to to recognize, let's say, quote, um, those errors uh, that might be systematic too, and um, provide accurate uh, estimation skill. So it's a question that definitely need that definitely needs some uh, extra testing. I would say that uh, some of those can perform pretty well, uh, even when there are artifacts and errors. Um, we might also need to perform some pre-processing uh, techniques before fitting some data to our models. This is uh, something that has to be examined, I guess, per case, per application, per project. So it might be an issue, but there are certain ways that we can approach it and um, let's say uh, surpass these problems and issues that might uh, arise from, from, from such errors and artifacts. Thank you. And uh, the other question, um which is more of a curiosity, curiosity question is, you mentioned that you got best uh, results with this uh, support vector regression method. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if uh, you try to play at all with Gaussian process regression and, and um, um, whether you, you can say anything about potential comparison between the two methods. I don't have any experience with uh, mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you. Um... Actually, with, with with all the models available, everything is possible. And especially in this paper, I remember, and this is a quite personal story, when I was writing this paper, you know, I started by selecting some of the models that I thought that they could provide some insights um, on how well we can predict uh, those parameters of interest using our inputs. And the selection of the model was, was trying to cover a big part. So I don't I don't know, to, to, to briefly answer that, I don't really, know the answer to this question. Yes, it would make, make sense to test this for sure. But you know, sometimes we're having all this option and we could end up having a huge list of all the models that we could use. And I even remember when I was writing this paper and I submitted it using like this uh, three methods in the beginning, then I had also the reviewers, you know, asking why you don't add this and why you don't add the other. And then why you're doing some ensemble learning techniques. So everything is possible and potentially everything makes sense to test you might be even able to get better results with some of the methods. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you. Any other question? I have uh, also a question, if it's possible. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Vasiliki, for a very nice talk and uh, an excellent uh, uh, work. My question is about the data that you have uh, collected uh, and uh, not just collected, but also processed. And uh, um, uh, and uh, I suppose <laughs> uh, generated data sets. So uh, actually two questions. What percentage of the time did you spend on uh, managing data, not really doing uh, learning, but just trying to, to wrestle with knowledge, with uh, incompatible uh numbers units all of that and uh, the second question is uh have you uh, had any experience with federated machine learning where uh, the idea is that you do not collect data but you 
the uh, synchronized partners uh, learn uh, with everybody's data, but at their own sites. Mm -hmm. uh, so I will first answer the second question. N no, I, I don't really have experience in that, but I find it like as an exciting avenue for research for sure. And that would be definitely an option, especially in, in these applications as well. And regarding your first question, uh, a huge amount of time was spent on the data uh, processes, including uh, generation. Uh, first of all, including the design of, of, of the data set, like uh, to look into the literature, to select the parameter, to choose one study over the other, or to combine studies, find the right populations in the literature from which you will draw the, da the data the distributions. Um, then to 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 prepare the code for right for, for generating the data set then it takes a lot of time as well to generate to run the model multiple times because uh it's important to mention that those 1d models are great tools but they can take time they can take a lot of time even those models that they are simple in comparison i mean this 1d model is much simpler in comparison to a 3d model for example that it has like all the 3d uh structure of a part of even the art, only if we isolate the art and we run this 3D a model of the art, it will take even more time. So imagine that even the 1D model that we're having takes a couple of, um, let's say a minute or two to run a simulation. So running running it multiple times, like thousands of times, this can take hours. And so you have to wait for this to be completed. And then when you're getting your data, you have to apply the filtering processes to do some data exploration, to see the outliers, why you're having like this higher levels of pressure, then you do some fine tuning on the gener on the generation process. So I would say that this is what takes most of the time and your data in machine learning processes, like the data really make the difference. If, you're don if you don't have high quality data and you don't really invest a lot of time on the design of your data uh, population, then you end, ha you end up having a model that doesn't really make sense. So you really want to, to mimic the content of, of of the test data, let's say, of the of, of the population that you want to make predictions about. You want to make a, a synthetic population that really mimics those properties of the real human data. And the closer you are uh, when you are making creating your training data set, the more the most the most useful the most the more useful your model will be. So. I would say that like data, uh, data preparation and data analysis takes most of the time. Then the model, like the algorithms are there. We, we, we work on the models. We, we change like the parameters of the model. We tune them, uh, we adjust them. Then it's like the training process, but this time is relatively smaller co in comparison to the data preparation for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Maybe I can also ask one question. You. You answered so many questions uh, last week when we meet. So maybe now that you are talking about the, the computational complexity of this, maybe I would like to ask uh, whether this could be a problem for uh, an online application where you want in an online manner to identify these parameters or in time scales that uh, in time scales that this could be a threat. I mean, or this is not a problem in these time scales that it cannot be a threat mm -hmm. if you detect some change in the parameters you identify? Mm -hmm. So first of all, um, this um, rendering uh, those estimations like into an online problem is, is definitely what would make sense. And so um, either you either you, you want to achieve a continuous or online monitoring or uh, let's say monitoring of a, of a, of a parameter on a regular base, basis uh, really depends on on the person that you want to to monitor to examine so if you're having like a, a patient with chronic disease or someone at high at high risk uh, perhaps uh, continuous online monitoring of certain parameters would make sense while if you're having a healthy individual or someone that ages normally then you might want just to perform uh, a couple of tests from time to time um so in terms of applicability, uh, I would say that machine learning applications, especially of this size, are totally feasible to be done uh, in an online manner. And like you can easily get the, the output that you want by running the, the program, like uh, the model. Uh, while in the case of the first method, the inverse problem solving method, this is not feasible at all. Like it's really time consuming. And this is really m mostly uh, for I would say for demonstration or like research purposes to explore if this is feasible. 
and then we can certainly uh, 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 apply different methods to 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 to, to emulate like the, this processes of the inverse problem solving method. Um, so yes, uh, I would say. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. All right. So thank you so much uh, for uh, talking to us today. No thank you very so. much for the invitation. <laughs> okay. Let's drink. All right, thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Have a great afternoon, evening. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Nice weekend.